Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we're actually now moving into the actual eight cases that, uh, that changed America today. And we're going we're to start with <clears throat> the case of Eisenstadt versus Baird. And uh, to give you some idea of why I chose this case to start with, if you look it up in Wikipedia, uh, what it says is that uh, Eisenstadt versus Baird was an extremely important United States Supreme Court case that established the right of unmarried people to possess and use contraceptives. And, uh, and also the right of unmarried people to engage in non-procreative sexual relations. So I thought that I'd uh, let you know that uh, we did the case that gave you that right. Thank you. You're, 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 you're perfectly welcome. I wanted to get a little kudos on that at the beginning of the course here. Uh, that, that's, that's in case anybody at all were interested in that, that issue. Uh, now, uh, with that, that, that having been said, uh, one of the reasons why this is one of the 50 most cited cases in the entire history of the United States is because it opened onto the famous case of Roe versus Wade, which was the right of women to choose whether or not to have an abortion, which has been, as you know, the centerpiece of a major confrontation that's been going on over the last 30 years between the reactionaries uh, in our in American culture and the progressive community. And a major confrontation has been going on mainly between about 99% of the women in the country and the entire Republican Party. Uh, now th this has been going on for some time and that we're going to be discussing that uh, on Thursday. And that's why I have the little case of Roe versus Wade kind of sitting here on the side because this kind of opens onto it. Because what this case did of Eisenstadt versus Baird was, uh, was actually quite uh, earth-shaking at the time. Uh, so I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how, how it came about. Uh, I, was, I had already, as I talked about in the first two meetings, I had already become the co-editor of the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review. And I had uh, sent out these letters across the country asking lawyers to contact us at the Civil Rights Law Review at Harvard if they had some really sticky constitutional issues that they wanted to be able to know how to get some help with. So I had already done this, and I had gone back to do my summer clerking for the, a law firm in uh, Boston, uh, the uh, Goodwin Proctor firm, Goodwin Proctor and Hoare. It was a, a, uh, a major, what they call, silk stocking law firm. That means it was you know, that all the guys wore wingtip shoes, wore the hats all the time, uh, you know, white shirts and uh, bow ties, some of them actually. Uh, it, was, it was one of those, it was a major State Street law firm. Uh, the the uh, chief uh, partner, the senior partner uh, was Donald J. Hurley. He was the president of the Boston Chamber of Commerce. He was a member of the Anasquam Yacht Club uh, in Boston. Uh, and, uh, and much to my pleasant surprise, uh, I discovered that he was a member of the Board of Overseers of Harvard College. Uh, because it turns out he is the guy that got me to apply for and get a full scholarship to Harvard College. <clears throat> and so because of that, I had, out of a sense of obligation, sense of obligation, gone back to do my initial summer clerking there at that firm, even though it was not a constitutional law firm and was not on the cutting edge of uh, public policy issues, but it was a pretty straight law firm. And it, it turns out one, uh, one morning uh, when I was doing my summer clerking, uh, I, got, uh, I got asked to go over to the motion session of the Superior Court of Massachusetts, just to go over there as a young law student, to go over and sit in the motion session. You know, you get to go inside the bar with all the rest of the lawyers and sit there and wait for your case to be called, and then I was supposed to stand up and say, this case uh, has been consented to on both sides to be postponed. At which point the, ju the judge in the motion says, you say, very good, postponed. And that was the, the extent of it. That was my uh, main uh, obligation of the day. I was sitting there waiting for this to take place when all of a sudden these two lawyers came rushing into the, into the courtroom, into the motion session, 
uh, Chet Paris and uh, Joe Bolero came rushing in. I recognized Joe Bolero. Bolero was a big criminal defense attorney. Uh, he was like the number three criminal defense attorney in Boston. You know, there was F. Lee Bailey and another one, another guy, and uh, Jerry Alch, and then there was this guy, Joe Bolero. He came rushing into the courtroom and pushed his way through the bar and came up to the clerk and started having this kind of excited conversation with them. So the clerk moved them to the front of the line and put them right up in front of the, the magistrate, the, the judge that was, was deciding these motions. They started uh, making arguments in behalf of trying to get a special order issued by the Superior Court of Massachusetts to the Supreme Court of the State of Massachusetts. It's referred to as the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. They were kind of stumbling around trying to figure out how to get the court to give them a special order so they didn't have to go through an entire long process of appeal and go through the Court of Appeals and then go all the way up to the Supreme Court later. Uh, they wanted to try to get this accelerated. And they had heard that there was some process that you could actually invoke to get there. Unfortunately, they didn't quite understand what that process was, and so they were arguing rather ineffectively in front of the judge. So I was sitting there, having come over from the Goodwin Proctor Straight Law Firm, sitting there uh, in my wingtip shoes and white shirt, and, uh, and so I heard them stumbling around trying to get this argument made. So, so basically, I got up and kind of went over and, and literally tugged Chet Paris by the jacket and I said, excuse me, uh, and I was talking about Joe Bolero, who's, I said, excuse me, he's dying up there. And he said, yes, he is. Yes, he is. I said, I think we can do something about this. I said, why don't you get him to stop? And I think I mentioned this earlier in our first meeting. Ask him to ask for a lunch hour, a lunch break, and uh, I think I can help you over the lunch hour. So he does. He asks the judge kind of pleadingly, you know, look, I'm dying here. Uh, could I please... Uh, get the lunch hour to try to figure out how to put this argument together a little better. The judge said, yes, you can. So we went back to the office. I went back, took lunch hour with them. I had just happened to have written a major law review article about this very process of how there was this ability to, to short circuit the entire appeals process and get in front of the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts and get what might otherwise be considered an advisory opinion which courts are very uh, reluctant to do. But I had done the law review article, so I knew exactly how to do it. So I went in and I, I made the argument for them uh, and sat down and typed the thing all up and worked with them and got, I dictated it actually uh, to the secretary. They typed it all up, we got back for lunch and we came into the courtroom and, uh, and there was the attorney general of the state waiting for us. Uh, and stood up in front of the judge, and I, I think I mentioned this, the judge looked over his glasses at him and said, uh, I think they have you here, Mr. Attorney General. And he says, yes, I think they do. So they shot it to the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts. Now, you, you've, read the, you've read the case, I believe, uh, in preparation for today, which you might not have understood from just uh, reading through it quickly. There were five different iterations of this particular case. Uh, but the bottom line is that at, at that first day, when it got accelerated up to the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts, when they, we walked out of the courtroom, we walked out of the courtroom, and uh, I, I uh, went back to the, I went back to, the, we got to the steps, and there was the, there was the uh, Boston Globe uh, newspaper there in the local television stations, and they all were taking pictures of us, and it uh, was in the, the, on the television news shows all that, uh, that evening. And so that it was all over the news that this thing had happened. That, the, uh, that it turns out that what had happened is these guys were contacted when Bill Baird, who was the vice president of the Emco Foam Corporation, a contraceptive foam company, uh, that's different from the phone company. It's, uh, <laughs> this, is the, this is the contraceptive foam company. Uh, that he, he had... Uh, he had been invited to Boston University to do a presentation to the young freshman class coming in, uh, as I mentioned to you, saying that, look, you, you people need to be very careful. Uh, you're going to be in college now, and you look to the person on your left, you look to the person on your right, and those people won't be here uh, when you graduate, uh, not because they haven't done their work well, but because of an unwanted pregnancy. And so therefore, you need to be very careful and he gave them a lecture advising them on the use of birth control. And he actually had some on display. 
He had the, some MCO foam cans there and some uh, prophylactics and some other things. And he said, and he got all done at the end of the, the presentation. He said, and for those of you who are interested, you might come up and just help yourself to these. And uh, when he said that, uh, the back door of the auditorium opened up and four sheriff, deputy sheriffs from Suffolk County came through the door, uniformed deputies, and arrested him off the stage and dragged him off. Uh, and charged him with the public display of a birth control device uh, and providing birth control devices to unmarried people, uh, which, were, which happened to be against the law of chastity uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, there was a, an old, old 1885 uh, statute that uh, prohibited the discussion with any unmarried person of uh, birth control uh, methods and the display of them in any way at all. And uh, so that he had been arrested for this. And so Joe Bolero and Chet Paris were contacted to come and help him. And so they came rushing in trying to figure out how to get this issue in front of the Supreme Court. And so I happened to have stepped in and been able to do this for them. But as it turns out, uh, as I said, I, uh, I uh, went back to the firm the following morning, to, to the Goodwin Proctor firm. And I came in and the, uh, the secretary of uh, Roger Stokey who was the head of uh, the litigation department at the, at, the, at the law firm, his secretary told me that Roger Stokey wanted to see me uh, the very next morning, first thing the next morning. So I said, uh, and I knew, I knew her uh, because I had worked there as, a, as an office boy before when I was in, it, uh, before I went to Harvard. And so I asked her, I said, what is this about uh, the, the picture in the newspaper and stuff? She says, I think it is. <laughs> and I went, oh. So I come in the next morning. And I, I came in like at, uh, at 8 o'clock. And I go up to his office. And I sit down in the office. And I'm waiting there for him when he comes in. And he comes in. Uh, and I, I remember this thing. He comes in with his hat. And his, then he, he puts, his, puts his hat up on the little tree. And he turns around. I was, and there I was. So he was kind of shocked. And he said, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Sheehan. It's always bad when someone starts out like that. Instead of saying, oh, Dan, how are you this morning? He says, Mr. Sheehan. And I go, oh, right. And I said, look, Mr. Stokey, look, before we go any farther, I said, look, I want to make it really clear. I went over there. I was over there doing a motion. I'd been asked by Mr. Hurley to go over there to do it. Uh, th these people just happened to have come in, and I happened to have done this law review article. I happened to knew it, know exactly how it was that they were supposed to do this. And so I just helped them out doing this. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, I understood that you wrote the brief. I said, well, yes, actually, I did. <laughs> I did write the brief. Uh, and, he's, and I said, uh, and look, and I want to make it really clear that, uh, you know, I did it, and I'm not the least bit sorry I did it, uh, and I'd do it again. I said, and so you're going to have to know that. If you guys want me to come and work at this firm, you know, you got to know that this is the kind of thing that I do. I'll keep on doing that. And uh, it doesn't make any difference to me what you think about that at all. So he looked at me kind of stunned, like, and he goes back over, he says, look, he says, he says, I don't, look, he says, I don't think you understand. He said, you don't know this, but I happen to be chief counsel for the Massachusetts Planned Parenthood League. And we've been trying to figure out for 20 years how to get this case up in front of the Supreme Court. <laughs> he said, how the hell did you do that? <laughs> and so I explained it to him briefly. Uh, and he said, look, look, he said, uh, I need to tell you, he said, uh, 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 whatever, whatever this is, he says, that you've got, don't lose it. He said, because, he said, I've been, I've been in this law firm now for 30 years, he said. And when I, started, when I went to law school back in 1942 and I started law school, he said, you know, I wanted to do the same kind of things that you're doing now. He said, but look at me now, he said, in this really stodgy law firm. And he, he opened up the drawer. And he said that a book that I got when I first went to law school, he said, he said here it is. He said, it's a Clarence Darrow, The Attorney for the Damned. He said, I got this book and read it, and this is why I, I, I wanted to become a lawyer. And he said, he said, and what I want to do is he said, I want to give this to you. And he did. So he, he gave me the book, uh, Attorney for the Damned, in that... If, if any of you really want to brown nose it up uh, in this course, you might want to read this book. You might want to read this book, and you could write your paper about this 
about this book, of how it is that Clarence Darrow in his time, back during the progressive era, represented the same kind of cause lawyering that is talked about in the essay that I had you read, uh, which is all about kind of more modern day uh, cause lawyering. There never even was such a thing as cause lawyering. Uh, back when we started doing all this kind of stuff back in the 60s and 70s, except that he, had, he was a cause lawyer. And so Roger Stokey uh, asked me if I would uh, write the briefs for the Massachusetts Planned Parenthood League and that he would agree to have me come with him and he would get a special motion made uh, to allow me to argue the case. So we did, we filed the amicus briefs uh, and Joe Bolero and Chet Paris uh, showed up at the Supreme Judicial Court and uh, I showed up at the Supreme Judicial Court and uh, Roger Stokey stood up and made the, the motion to have me admitted though I was at that time only a, a first year law school uh, student uh, and asked if I would be allowed by special motion to be able to argue this case to the court and uh, that's when the chief judge of the, the Massachusetts Supreme Court uh, looked over at me and he said, he looked down and he said, Daniel Sheehan, Daniel Sheehan. He says, that would be Danny, right? Danny Sheehan? And I said, yes. He said, what's a good Irish Catholic boy like you doing in a case like this? <laughs> that's what he said to me. I said, well, Your Honor, uh, at, at Harvard, even young Catholic uh, Irishmen believe in the Constitution. So we, we made the argument and the, the Supreme Judicial Court struck down as unconstitutional one of the two counts on which uh, Baird had been arrested. He'd been arrested and charged with the public display of a birth control vice. And what they, they supported the argument that I made that in fact that was a violation of the First Amendment to, to punish him for the simple display of a birth control device in the process of openly advocating the use of birth control uh, on behalf of unmarried people. They agreed to that, but they disagreed with the second uh, argument uh, in which I argued that, in fact, it was illegal to punish him for actually providing a birth control device to an unmarried person. Uh, they said that that was constitutional and that he was guilty of that, and they sustained the conviction. So they didn't know what to do. They, they said, well, should we go to the Supreme Court immediately? And I, because they had an opinion now from, uh, from the uh, chief, the head, head uh, court in the state, the highest court in the state, you can appeal for a petition for a writ of certiorari if you, if you want to do that. And that's a completely discretionary writ that the, the Supreme Court looks at. Cases that come out of the Supreme Court of the states, they, it's completely optional for a, so the Supreme Court as to whether or not it will review any of those and you uh, petition for the issuance of a writ of certiorari, they call it. And in 98% of the cases, they turn it down because they're quite reluctant to go in and strike down a decision made by the Supreme Court of a state. So I said what we ought to do instead is we ought to go to the federal district court here, the lowest trial level court in the federal system, and we should apply for a petition for the issuance of a writ of uh, habeas corpus to attack the criminal conviction on this second count, count collaterally. Well, they thought that was extraordinarily unorthodox and that how, how, why would you do something like that instead of petitioning for a writ of certiorari? And I said, because if you petition for the issuance of a writ of certiorari, you got a 98% probability of not succeeding. Whereas if you go to the federal district court and you apply for the petition for the issuance of a writ of habeas corpus and they deny that, then you go to the First Circuit Court of Appeals and you get me in front of the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and we're going to walk away with this thing. What's a habeas corpus? Uh, the, a habeas corpus is, the, is one of the most ancient uh, rights uh, that is that you have to produce the body. Habeas corpus is the Latin for you have the body, and you have to produce the body. If you've arrested someone or you've taken someone into custody and a writ of uh, habeas corpus is filed, they are mandated, any state agency and state court is mandated to produce the body and bring the body of the person arrested into court and then you can challenge the, the holding of you in custody. And that's the, that's the most ancient writ that's protected in the Constitution. So even though there was a lot of uh, hand-wringing and, and, and uh, scowling going on about this particular procedure, 
we went ahead and did it, and I put together the, uh, the motion for the issuance of a, a writ of, search, of, a writ of uh, habeas corpus to the federal district court. We filed it with them. They found this to be so unorthodox uh, that they dismissed it, at which point we appealed immediately to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And we went in front of the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and I was given permission again to argue the case there for Roger Stokey. And we went in and we argued the case, and we produced that uh, humdinger uh, of a decision that you, you may not have read, but you really should go take a look at the First Circuit Court of Appeals opinion. Because this is the actual opinion that was up in front of the United States Supreme Court. Because it's not a, not a, a petition for the issuance of writ of certiorari, discretionary writ, when you come out of a federal court of appeals. When you come out of a federal court of appeals, you apply to the Supreme Court for a review of this, and you have a much higher probability of having the Supreme Court grant a review of this. And so that's the way we did this. And so even though the, the uh, federal district court fairly quickly thought that this was an unorthodox way of going about things, of petitioning for a habeas corpus on, a, on an appeal like this, they denied it. We went up in front of the, the First Circuit Court of Appeals. We argued the case in front of the Court of Appeals. And Judge Aldrich wrote this. He's the one that wrote the opinion, actually blasting the whole statute. And the way we went at it was a very interesting process. We went at it explaining to them how the real intent of this statute was to satisfy the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church opposed birth control as such, uniquely, and that the statute that was passed by the Massachusetts State Legislature was a total prohibition against birth control, period, by anybody. Married people, unmarried people, anybody was prohibited from using birth control because it was considered to be a mortal sin by the Catholic Church, actually by the hierarchy of the, of the Catholic Church, not by anybody else in the Catholic Church. 99.9% <laughs> of all the, the, the regular civilian Catholics uh, think it's silly, uh, uh, but of course they're not the ones who are celibate, on the other hand. And so, the, uh, so the, the, the bottom line is that, that I went right after it, taking advantage of being an Irish Catholic boy uh, in front of the court, and went right after the church and saying, look it, uh, let's get clear about this, that this was done by the Catholic church. They're the ones who put the pressure on the legislature. They're the ones that passed it. They made it a complete prohibition. And after the United States Supreme Court ruled on Griswold versus Connecticut back in 1965, which struck down as unconstitutional, a, a criminal statute which prohibited married people from using contraception in the state of Connecticut. Again, because of the Catholics in Connecticut. And the, it was struck down as unconstitutional. And so what we did is we came in through the side door and we argued that in light of the fact that it had been struck down as unconstitutional uh, to prohibit the use of contraception on the part of married people, what I argued was that it was an irrational distinction to prohibit the use of birth control by unmarried people if it was a constitutionally guaranteed right of married people to engage in sexual intercourse and not have to do it for purposes of procreation. Now that was the big, big bazoo, that one. I mean, to put that one right in front of them and say, and the, the Chief Justice asked me, Judge Aldrich said, are you arguing, Mr. Sheehan, that uh, unmarried people have a fundamentally guaranteed right to engage in sexual intercourse? And I said, absolutely, Your Honor. <laughs> absolutely. Let's not leave any doubt about that whatsoever. <laughs> I said, you know, and unless, and unless you disagree that married people have an absolute right to have engaged in sexual intercourse when they're not intending to have children, he says, then it's a completely arbitrary and capricious distinction to be made it, to prohibit unmarried people from having access to birth control. And, and it sold it. But we had to back up and go through this long process to make it perfectly clear that this was the Catholic Church that was doing this. And that the purpose of so we went through a long discussion of the legislative history of this particular act in Massachusetts that showed that everybody was prohibited under the statute. Then when the United States Supreme Court in 1965 ruled in Griswold, striking down the statute as it applied to, to married people, then, in fact, they changed the statute. They went in and filed an amendment saying, OK, OK, so we won't say that married people are prohibited, but unmarried people are prohibited from having it. And only a physician can even give it to married people. 
And we argued that that was also illegal. It was an illegal uh, interference in their right because it didn't take a physician to prescribe a, a condom, you know, or, or a, a spermicide, you know, that it was ridiculous. Uh, and so, because in, in 38 other states, you could go in and buy it right off the shelf in the pharmacy, except for in Connecticut and in in Massachusetts, right? And so the, they went along with that. And we, we got, the, we got the, uh, the, first, uh, the First Circuit Court of Appeals to basically dance up and down on the grave of the district court and, uh, and just, just pounded them. And that's the one that went up in front of the Supreme Court. Now, as, you, as you, you know, you can see, as I said, right in Wikipedia, it says that this is the very important case that declared the right of unmarried people to have access to and use birth control and therefore the, uh, the, the protection and establishment of their fundamental right to engage in non-procreative uh, non, uh, sexual intercourse. That's to be read recreational. Uh, of uh, pro, of non-procreative is, uh, and that, that was another question that the judge asked me. He says, are you talking about recreational sex? I said, absolutely, Your Honor. <laughs> that is what I'm talking about here. Uh, and so, and so it, it's one of the lessons is, that, you know, don't back away. When, when, you're, when you're making an argument uh, in front of a court in the future, for all of you, uh, you know, when they say, are you trying to suggest? You, know, you say, absolutely. You know, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because the minute you start crabbing away, you know, I mean, a, 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 an appellate judge is just like a mad dog. You know, if it knows you're afraid of them, it will bite you. you know? So you'd never be afraid of them. You step right up and you tell them what, what the issue is. So that's how it went up to the United States Supreme Court. And even though, uh, for example, you see, you see articles like in The Nation, in The Nation, uh, in Mar March 22nd of 2012, like this is less than a month ago, The Nation, big headline, The Nation still fighting Eisenstadt versus Baird. And it goes into a long discussion about the latest flap that went on with Obama. When Obama mandated that any uh, hospital that, in fact, uh, uh, employed more than a set number of people had to provide health insurance that also covered contraception for their employees, their female employees. And, uh, and that's where this thing started again. And it, and it turns out, it turns out that uh, it, the, when, when, when uh, uh, both Mitt Romney and uh, Rick Santorum were confronted uh, about this, uh, they, they in fact took right off like a big bird uh, and, and insisted that they thought that Roe versus Wade, uh, not only Roe versus Wade was wrongly decided, but the fact is they thought that in fact Griswold versus Connecticut was wrongly decided and Eisenstadt versus Baird were, un, uh, were incorrectly decided. So that, that happened during the debate uh, that was uh, the ABC uh, television debate that was chaired by George Stephanopoulos, and it says right here, this is uh, Jeffrey Tubin, uh, the big uh, NBC uh, legal correspondent, he said, when pressed by George Stephanopoulos in the debate on Saturday night, Romney went beyond mere opposition to Roe versus Wade. He said that he believed the Griswold versus Connecticut, the 1965 Supreme Court case that made explicit the right of privacy, was also wrong. I don't believe they decided that correctly, Romney said. Romney said. In this, the front runner was eagerly seconded by Rick Santorum, who said that the justices had created an entirely new constitutional right that was nowhere in the Constitution. And they went on and on uh, about this. So this is, this is something that is still being fundamentally debated. And the, the connection between those two cases, Griswold versus Connecticut, that established the right of uh, married people to use contraception, and Eisenstadt versus Baird, that, that not only granted the right to unmarried people to possess and use contraception, but also to engage in recreational sexual intercourse, uh, a great constitutional right, uh, he's, they, they all thought that that was incorrect. And so now we've got the Democratic Party uh, defending your rights. Uh, in a fundamental way against Rick Santorum and, uh, and against Romney, who are going to be checking you out to try to stop you from even considering uh, exercising this constitutional right. Now, I won't, I won't put out any devices and ask you to come up to help yourself. 
or anything like Bill Baird. We're not doing that here. I'm just trying to get you to appreciate the importance of this particular Supreme Court decision. Now, but very importantly, that you've, you've read the decision now, and uh, I think it's extremely important, even though I'm a major champion of this particular interpretation of the, of the decision, uh, I would assume that a number of you noticed that there were only four justices that actually supported the majority opinion in this particular case. Pardon? They listened to the oral arguments. They didn't, they, yeah. they didn't read oh. the opinion. Okay. How many of you have actually read the opinion? Well, five. Okay. Well, then let me, let me point out. You, you heard the oral arguments, but the way, the way that the case came down, the way that it's reported publicly, it was a six-to-one victory with Justice Berger dissenting. Now, the first question you'll ask is six to one. How come there's only seven people there? What happened to Rehnquist and Powell? Well, they had been chosen for the Supreme Court, but they hadn't been on the Supreme Court yet to participate in the oral arguments. So you may have noticed that neither Rehnquist nor Powell was there uh, during the oral argument. And so that neither one of them participated in it. And so, so Berger uh, was isolated as the sole dissenter in this case. But Justice Brennan, who wrote the opinion, was joined in his opinion only by Douglas and, and Potter Stewart in, in Marshall. So there were only four justices that actually supported this major decision. And the decision went right down the line of the secondary arguments that were made in the, second, in the First Circuit Court of Appeals about the clear intent of the statute that the statute was clearly intended by the legislature in Massachusetts to prohibit all birth control. And that their effort to kind of crab backwards from that and keep amending it to try to save as much of it as they could in the face of decisions by the United States Supreme Court was an illegitimate activity on their part. And that was what Berger dissented about. Berger dissented saying, a very technical thing, saying, look, it, a legislature has the right to put forth any argument they want on behalf of a statute. You can't hold them to it. Well, the majority didn't agree with that. And so, the, so what we have is we have a, a, a major constitutional case in which four of the justices supported the broader understanding of the right, but two of them, uh, Justice Wizard White and Blackman, uh, took a much more narrow position on this thing. And they, it was a very peculiar opinion, actually, uh, and Justice White and Justice Blackman entered into an opinion saying, saying very peculiarly that uh, there was nothing in the record that actually established that the woman who had come up and been given one of these, uh, this can of MCO foam, there was nothing in the record that really proved that she was unmarried. Uh, and that's true because everybody understood that she was unmarried. And so that they, they took this, there was this resistance on the part of Blackman and White to go so far as to actually endorse the broader concept that there was a fundamentally uh, constitutionally guaranteed right of unmarried people to engage in sexual intercourse uh, in light of the fornication laws that, that are still on the books. That uh, for any of you who didn't know about that and have to carry a little card around uh, setting forth your constitutional right, uh, you can cite this case, uh, that uh, the fact is that it's still a, a misdemeanor, uh, punishable by 90 days in jail and a, a $2,000 fine. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that all you have to do is basically assert your rights under Eisenstadt versus Baird, and the, any action that would ever be taken against you would be summarily dismissed. Because as time has gone on, this case has come to be read as establishing that fundamental right. And uh, there has been, a, a history has followed from this. For example, uh, there are three cases that have been, uh, as I say, this is one of the 50 most cited cases in the history of the court. And that in uh, 1977, there was a case called Carey versus the Population Services, which struck down a New York State statute that made it a criminal violation to give contraceptives to anyone under 16. Okay, and then there began another fight that went on about whether or not gay, gay men had the right to engage in uh, sexual relations 
Uh, and that, in fact, was uh, sustained in Lawrence versus Texas. Uh, so that this right has come to be perceived as a fundamental right that flows out of the Griswold case. Okay? So now I, I told you, I promised that, that while the first couple lectures, there was going to be a lot more talking on my part to try to get everybody to know kind of what the, the course was going to be like, I promised that I was going to try to have it uh, have much more discussion in the classes so that, that uh, I want to I talk about this. We, we can reserve most of our discussion about Roe versus Wade and the issue about the right to abortion or not till Thursday. But this particular, uh, this particular uh, case, I want to start talking about that now to see what your ideas are about this and what questions you might have about the process by means of which certain rights that clearly are not put right into the Constitution. There's nowhere in the Bill of Rights, for example, when you're reading through it, uh, which I suggest you do, uh, you're not going to see there's a fundamental right of non-married people to engage in recreational sexual intercourse. It's not going to be there. So there's a very interesting set of discussions to be had around the question about how that, how that process comes to be where a right of that nature, that special nature, can be deemed to be fundamental and constitutionally protected. So, anyway, so that's, that's my initial presentation on this. And of course, as you might guess, I could go on for another hour uh, about it. But I want to I want to have some discussion about that now. I saw you you, you had a question. What, what's your name, Solomon? Corey. What, Corey. Corey. What's what's your first one? Uh, the first one was regarding your your comment on that there's still uh, misdemeanor laws on the book. Yes. And that you could potentially be uh, arrested, but not obviously uh, effectively or, prosecuted. Yeah. Um, is there any chance that should you be prosecuted or not prosecuted, um, charged with those offenses, mm -hmm. that you could? Uh, um, have the police officers sued for abusing their, their um, power under uh, color of authority? It's, really, it's a really interesting question. The, the, uh, in light of the present status of this, what my experience is, based on about 40 years of this, is that any effort to bring an action against a law enforcement officer for engaging in bad faith meets with a very heavy burden. Uh, which you have to prove, basically, they, the, the, the justice, the judges uh, have actually, remember that a vast majority of judges were former prosecutors. They come through that line because the prosecutors are in, uh, it's a political office. The district attorney is uh, an elected official. They're usually a member of the, the dominant political party in the community. Uh, and they all, every single district attorney you've ever met always thinks that he or she is going to be president of the United States. They, they start out that way, right? Uh, and so that they think that's the entrance, entering uh, office. And so that they are never going to go crossways with law enforcement officers. They just aren't. Uh, not that they shouldn't, but it's going to be one of, it's this initial question, Corey, in our, our time together is opening on to one of the major issues that we're going to be discussing here is that they're, there is a reality that functions in our legal system that is not, in fact, affirmed in writing on the books, which is the most dangerous of all kinds of things to be going on, because basically it's hypocritical. You know, you, you teach people in, in college classes and law school classes about their fundamental rights, et cetera, and you always have to say, oh, yeah, but it won't work if you really try to do that. That because what they'll argue is that the, all the police officer has to be able to allege is that they had a good faith belief that they were authorized, in fact, required to enforce this statute. And that, the, that your, your remedy is not to go after this law enforcement officer and have him or her prosecuted or civilly held liable. Your real remedy is to go to the legislature and get them to take that off the books. And the problem is, is that every time you start to try to do that, then you rustle up all the right-wing Republicans, and they start going ballistic, and they start acting like Rick Santorum and the others, and start asserting that you know, this is a horrible, a horrible uh, precedent to establish, that young people have a right to engage in recreational sex. You know? uh, we may not be able to stop it, but we certainly aren't going to legalize it. You know? So that I would say that your chances of succeeding in a case like that would probably be one in a thousand. Uh, even though, even though you could argue that there's no realistic way in which they should have been able to effectively argue they had a good faith 
belief that they were going to be enforcing that. And what you'd normally try to do is figure out uh, from a point of view of investigation is why they really did it. And that's the one you go after them for. You go after them for what they call discriminatory enforcement. That anybody who prosecutes anybody for doing that when, not, you know, out of any 10 million cases, nobody gets prosecuted, then what you would say is this was a discriminatory motive. They had a class-based, invidious, discriminatory animus, if you know the terms. Uh, but you just say, look, at, this guy had it in for me. There was, some, there was some reason why this person did this. Uh, but you have to be able to show that it wasn't just because they didn't like you or because, you know, you happened to be with his daughter, for example. <laughs> you know? Uh, but, but you'd have to say that it was some kind of a class-based discriminatory hostility. It was because of your race, because of your religious, ethnic background, something like that. Then you could, then you could win uh, in a case like that. It's a hard, hard case to prove, but you could win. What's your second question? Uh, just a comment on how you said, you know, like uh, you got the, the good old Santorum and Romney saying, you know, we, we can't, we looked in the Constitution and we can't find any right that says you could do this. Yeah. Like, as you know, I'm just making a statement because it makes me feel good. Like the Constitution doesn't give you rights, it, guarantee, it, it just affirms your rights. And so just because it's not listed doesn't mean it's not there. Actually, actually, it's, it's a, a good try. That's a good try. But it isn't what it does. Yeah. What it really does is it tells what, when, when, they, when they set up the Constitution, you remember, very importantly, when the Constitution was set up, all it was talking about to begin with was the federal government. The colonies had existed for some time, and they had a whole bunch of laws and statutes and law enforcement, and everything. but when they set up the federal government, there was a great deal of concern about the power of a centralized federal government. And so what they did, Madison and the, and the other people said, that, look, if we're going to approve of these three articles in the main constitution that we're going to approve here in 1789, we want to have a promise that right away we're going to be able to get a bill of rights that are going to be put in here. And what we're going to put in here, we're going to, what we're really saying is that, the, for example, in the First Amendment, Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of press, the press. What it's really doing is it's making very clear what the powers are that have not been delegated to the federal government. Now, it's a little technical, but, but what it is, they're setting, up, they're, they're setting up a brand new government, and the government doesn't exist beforehand. It doesn't exist by dint of God. No, there's no divine right for them to have a, a federal government here. They're setting up a government which is a creation of the people, and that the people are setting up a government, and there are certain powers that the people are delegating over to the federal government. And there's going to be a whole bunch of rights that they want to make clear that they're not giving them. And they're not giving them the right to pass any statutes that infringe freedom of the press. And they're not giving them any statute, any power that gives them the right to interfere in the right of religion. And so what they're doing is they're saying, look, there are, it's, you could argue that they're affirming certain rights that they think exist by way of natural law. But technically what they're doing is they're making explicit the fact that there is no delegation of authority going to the federal government to interfere it with, with this kind of activity. That's what they're saying. So you're saying that it's just, well, why would they need to do the second part when Section 8, Article 1, explicitly says, you know, the 17 powers of, that Congress could do? Yeah. Well, really what it is is that the, the most important one is the Ninth Amendment. In the Ninth Amendment, what it says is that just because we've identified a certain number of specific rights here that we've explicitly refused to allow delegation of power to go to the con the, that doesn't mean that there aren't more of these rights that are retained by the people. In fact, there are more. And they, and they say it explicitly in the Ninth Amendment. And so that's, that's where the key is to this thing. And that's why, as a matter of fact, in Griswold, in Griswold, that was the major argue, one of the major arguments that was made. In Griswold versus Connecticut, they went right straight to the Ninth Amendment and asserted that this was one of those fundamental rights uh, that people just, everybody all assumed people had, and that therefore it was outrageous for, in that particular case, the state to try to do this. Now, that raises another complex question is, how did the same set of concepts that were understood to be enforced against the federal government in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, how did that end up restraining the power of the states? It was the 14th Amendment. That was after the Civil War. 
It was after the Civil War in which the, the, uh, the nation basically came to the conclusion that some of the state governments had so abused their authority uh, over and against certain people in the, in the community that there had to be a, a constitutional amendment stating that the state, the state governments also were restricted from engaging in certain types of activity. Now, the, the, the two amendments that were passed were the 13th and 14th Amendment. And so a lot of people argue that, well, they must have been talking just about the black race because the Civil War has just been fought and, and, and won. Uh, and this, this uh, 14th Amendment was passed in, uh, in 1865 right after the Civil War concluded in 1864. And they said, therefore, we're inferring that the purpose of the 13th and 14th Amendment taken together was just to protect the equal rights of black people. Okay? Uh, but, there was a, but there was, in fact, a, a, a term that was put into those constitutional amendments that said that no person shall be deprived of the due process of law. And so that under the due process clause, uh, they, they, they had a rights, privileges, and immunities. It says in the 14th Amendment, no person shall be deprived of any right, privilege, or immunity of citizenship of the United States by reason of race or anything else. And so that there was a whole understanding of some people that drafted the Constitution that the rights, privileges, and immunities of citizens of the United States was the actual phrase where these rights resided, okay? But, but because of peculiarities in history, uh, the, 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 southern, the southern states rose up against that shortly after the Civil War and after the approval of the 14th Amendment. And so what the progressive, the members of the progressive community in the United States moved in and started going to the due process clause and saying that when it says that Nobody can be deprived of rights, privileges, or immunities of citizens of the United States except by due process of law. They went over into the due process of law and insisted that there were certain fundamental rights that belonged to citizens that were so fundamental and so commonly assumed to be possessed by a citizen over and against their government that they basically brought in the, the aversion to the king and the powers of the king that had been effective in limiting the powers of the federal government they brought them in and asserted them against the state governments. And then the, the, the long history, that in, the, in when if I end up ever teaching a constitutional law class here, we can go into much more detail about all of that. But the, but the reality of this is, is that in, with regard to this particular right of unmarried people, uh, as compared to married people, they, the Supreme Court basically took the position that there is no rational reason to support criminalizing the use of contraceptives on the part of unmarried people if, in fact, one recognizes that there is a fundamental constitutional right of married people to use contraceptives. And so that's, that's how this case got established, and it is cited repeatedly as the source of that particular right. So that, those are the, that's the first couple of questions. And your name is? Chelsea. Chelsea, yes, Chelsea. Um, Well, the, the, the fact is that you want to get a definitive ruling on a, a constitutional right, and the argument is, is that the longer you wait and go through more and more lengthy processes, the longer that right is being chilled on the part of others. And there's an assumption that these fundamental rights, if one is correct in, in identifying a particular right as a, a, a fundamental constitutional right, the longer the citizenry has to suffer the threat of being punished for exercising it, they believe that that's such an important thing to solve as fast as possible that they allow you to get on the fast track to get up to the Supreme Court of the state. And the reason that they do that is primarily to give you the ability to put it in front of the Supreme Court because the, the writ of sorcery says you can't apply for that to the Supreme Court until the highest court in the state has passed on it. So what, what I did is I just figured out, a, a, I took advantage of that, that accelerated opportunity, but then rather than go right straight to the Supreme Court because of the odds against us, 
went through the other side door of the, of the federal district court and into the circuit court of appeals to increase the probabilities that we could get in front of the Supreme Court. And it, uh, it didn't, take, didn't take long. So that was, that was the thinking behind all that. So, yes, you your name is? Uh, Anthony. Anthony, yes. You mentioned recently that um, there was debate over Obama including contraception for women's health care. Yes. Um, I was wondering if women's health issues were brought up at all in Eisenstadt or if they were brought up later in Roe v. Wade or anything like that. Oh. I really just argued it on the basis of the irrational distinction just because they don't want to have kids. Well, it, it's, it's interesting. The, the, our objective in, in crafting the case the way that we did is we wanted to stay away from uh, as many complex issues as we could. Is we wanted to, because my opinion is, 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 as you heard me say, Corey, is that when you read the Constitution as a, a, a self-conscious limitation on the power of the federal government, and thereby derivatively on the part of state governments too, under the 14th Amendment, that if you think of it in terms of what are they authorized to do and what are they not authorized to do, one of the very first things that you have to get past is this intrinsic assumption that a lot of people have that the government can do anything it feels like unless you can prove they shouldn't. You see, it's a question of who has the burden of proof? Who has the burden of going forward? Who has the, who has the fundamental burden to be able to convince a court that they ought to be able to either do something or stop people from doing something? And what you have to do very quickly is you've got to get the presumption put in the right place. So what we wanted to do is to get the presumption put on the fact that the, the federal government and the state governments are of limited power and that if they've not been explicitly granted the authority to do something, no matter how clear their statute is, then they can't do it. And it's a constitutional question. So what we were saying is, look, it's perfectly clear that what they were doing is they were wanting to prohibit the use of contraceptives, period, to begin with. And, uh, and, th and they did. They, they outlawed it for everybody. And then what happened is when Roe versus, when, uh, when uh, Griswold was decided in 1965, what they did is they turned around and they said, oh, we are extremely concerned about women's health. So that on third thought, we'll pass this statute to protect women's health. And of course, they ran right into the problem of the fact that that wasn't what was motivating them originally at all. It was the desire to, to prohibit all contraception. So what we did is we went in and showed, look at what, what is the health danger to the use of a condom? Or what is the health danger of using a particular spermicide, which is available in 38 other states, uh, you know, just by walking into the, into the drugstore and getting it. You know, the, the, and that was the decision that was made, actually, by Wizard White uh, that Blackman joined in. What he said is, look, the state has not met its burden here. The state has been unable to show that either of these birth control devices <coughs> presented any reasonable danger to women's health. And so the fact that they put the burden on the state to prove it rather than us in having to prove that in fact uh, women's health, you know, was at risk or wasn't at risk. And, you know, I kept saying over and over again, you know, that's not the point here. The point is that that isn't what they intended. It was, it's just a fraud. And, and I kept saying, this is just a big fraud. You know, the, they're standing here, the attorney general is standing here attempting to work fraud upon the court. And, and, and that worked because that is exactly what he was trying to do. Okay, but you can see that Berger... Berger, in his dissent, seized right on that. If you take a look at that, Berger seized on that, and he said, wait a second, since when, since when has it been required that the state have to prove, you know, the, the legitimacy of what it's doing? You know, it's the, they're presumed to have the authority to do most anything they want. And there, there you saw in stark terms the difference in the fundamental assumptions that exist on the part of right-wing Republicans like Berger or on you know, sort of progressive Democrats such as, such as Brennan. <clears throat> because Brennan thoroughly gets the issue that the government is of a limited power. And th this tracks all the way back to the basic fundamental concept in Europe that the king was the state and that the king was somehow endowed by God 
with the authority to govern. And so anybody who tried to challenge the authority of the king to do anything he felt like, you know, ran right up against this divine right of kings and that they were basically functioning as the delegate uh, of God on earth. And <clears throat> in fact, you may recall that they used to be appointed by the pope. They were, they were at the original kings were ordained by the pope. Uh, so you, it's a good question because so you, you see when you, when you read that Berger opinion and you read the, the opinion by Justice Brennan, you can see that they're basically coming from two completely different places. One, that, that Berger is assuming the state has the right to do anything that they feel like unless the citizen can prove that they've got some absolute fundamental right that is being you know, violated by it. And on the other hand, uh, Brennan is saying that a citizen has an absolute right to do whatever they want to do unless the state can, has met its burden in proving very specific things. And one of these was that somehow you know, a condom or a contraceptive foam could in fact, was in fact a major health threat to the women. So that's where the health issue of women came in. But that I, was, I was going out of my way, uh, both, in, both in front of the Supreme Judicial Court and in front of the First Circuit Court of Appeals, to point out that, look, that's not the issue here. This is a big, this is a big smoke screen. This is just a big fraud here that the Attorney General is doing. And so we didn't have to go down that road. So, and then, but, but in Roe versus Wade, when we come together on Thursday to discuss that, you'll see that this issue comes up again. This fundamental issue of, of women to have a right in their doctors to make decisions about their health and what authority the state has to intervene in that is going to become a major, a major issue uh, when we discuss Roe versus Wade. Okay? Hey, Paul. There was a public morality argument made as well, right? The, I listened through to the oral arguments in preparation for the, uh, the class next week, the section next week, and with the, I think I remember the, the defendants of the right to contraception arguing that because there's an opportunity for married women who are separated from their husbands to, to go and get contraception and therefore engage in sexual intercourse essentially out of, out of the right. marriage setting, yeah. there, was, there were no efforts taken whatsoever by the state to prevent that kind of activity from happening. And that's what prevented them from making a morality argument, right? Um, but but can, do you mind commenting a bit on? Do, do you remember oh, the, no, the I, morality yeah. argument? Is, yeah. Is that something that they could have gotten away with? If they've been able to. Well, you, you see, you see that Berger touched on that again. Berger touched on that in his in his uh, dissent. He said, "Wait a second. Since since when? Since when has the has the state not had the authority to take steps to prohibit a certain activity just because it was deemed immoral?" Now, what we did is when that, that issue came up in those, in those arguments earlier before the Supreme Court, what we said is, wait a second, this is the Catholic Church. See, once again, when you're not afraid of saying it, this is the Catholic Church saying that it's immoral. You know, the Catholic Church is the only one that says that it's immoral. It's not, it's not the population that says it's immoral. Uh, women don't consider it immoral. Men don't consider it immoral. You know, 99% of the people in the Catholic Church don't believe it's immoral. The people who believe it's immoral are all the celibate priests. And that's what I said to them. I said, you know, and so that's what they're saying. But, you know, they've got a very peculiar attitude about morality. And actually, I went to the point, of, you know, so that what I was saying is that, again, I refused to go into that swamp with them. But I kept saying over and over again is that when you have the facts, like you have in this particular case, you stick right to them. You don't allow yourself to be drawn off into some kind of more abstract, ethereal, or metaphysical discussion. <coughs> About, the, about morality and what constitutes morality and who gets to say what morality is, what authority does the state have in general to make decisions about morality. You stay, you stay right with the facts. And, the, and you'll notice that that's what ended up happening, that the, the, four, the four judges in, in the plurality opinion uh, in the Supreme Court, they tracked right down that argument. They said, look, you know, we're buying the argument that this is a fraud that these people were putting in a statute specifically trying to, uh, to prohibit the use of birth control, and that's the morality about it. Now, there, there, was, there was, in fact, a, a long discussion by Brennan, an interesting discussion in the opinion, if you want to take a look at it, where he said, wait a second now, uh, is what the Attorney General was saying down there is that they were 
prohibit, they were going to prohibit the use of birth control as a method to try to enforce the anti-fornication law. <coughs> he said, look, the, the, the fornication law, the fornication law only is only a, a penalty of $2,000 and 90 days in jail. Why would they have a statute that has a five-year criminal penalty? Why would, why would they have that possibly as a way of enforcing a, a, uh, a statute that is supposedly being enforced for morality? If they want to make, if they want to really increase the punishment for fornication, why don't they do that? Instead of having it be a 90, a 90 day punishment, why don't they make it a five year penalty? You know? Now, fortunately, he didn't make that argument in front of me. I was saying, no, that's a bad idea. That's a real bad idea. Don't go telling them anything to do here. But, the, but, the, but the, this, this, this issue came up, and, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting process because what, what I was doing basically is I was basically just staying like this constantly, holding, holding the court inside this argument about the fact that this was a big fat fraud and that the legislature was, was putting a con job over on the, on the court and the attorney general standing right there was doing it too. And the, the advantage that I had is that the attorney general knew that he was. And so every time he got up there and tried to pretend it wasn't true, he just, he just looked stupid, you know? And that's how it happened. Uh, okay, so so that, that morality argument, fortunately, we didn't have to take it on directly. Now, the issue of the fornication law, if, if in fact uh, they had gone ahead and, and made the fornication law a five-year criminal penalty, then we'd have to deal with that. You know, then we'd have to bring a major federal injunction to try to enjoin the enforcement of that law, arguing that in fact there was this fundamental right that the other side would point out, well, there were only, there were only four justices that agreed with that. You know, and it was there were three justices on the on the uh, first circuit court of appeals that believed such a right existed. There were four justices on the Supreme Court, but you didn't get a fifth. And and they might smile at us and say, "Go up there and try to get five now, in support of that, and see where you get." You know, and, and that's that's true. That's true because it's quite clear that the 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 re reactionary judges on the Supreme Court right now, the four of them, you know, that are there are going to think that the state, being imbued with authoritative power from God, basically, you know, having that old European theory of the power of the state, that they have a right to pass laws prohibiting immoral conduct whenever they feel like it. Of course, and, and unless you're able to show that the particular morality that they're attempting to enforce is the morality of a unique and identifiable religious sect, such as the Catholic Church, you're going to be hard put to deal with those guys. But if you can show that the particular immoral act that the state legislature has prohibited turns out to be an immoral act only by definition of a particular religious sect. You know, for example, if they wanted to make, you know, back in the days, you know, eating meat on Friday, you know, a moral, uh, which the church declared to be a moral <coughs> sin, the Catholic Church, if, they, if the, the state legislature wanted to make it a, a, a criminal act for a restaurant to serve meat on Friday in Massachusetts, you know, then you'd go in front of the court and say, look it, uh, whatever the abstract argument you want to make about the morality of this, the fact is that only one particular religious sect happens to believe that it's immoral, indeed a moral sin. And what you're really doing is you're backing the play of that church. And so this is a statute that is attempting to effectuate a particular state religion. And then you'd attack it, and you'd win in that particular case. But on the other hand, there's, there's things that are immoral. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll, get, I'll let you, here's a, here's a hummer for you guys. Uh, right here, there's a, there's a case that uh, uh, was, was in front of the, uh, the Supreme Court of the state of Florida. It's called Casado, C-A-S-A-D-O, versus the state of Florida. And in this particular case, what you have is a is a, a 54 year old man uh, who was teaching, uh, I think it was Taekwondo courses, to young teenage boys, and uh, he told them that uh, that in order to pass their final uh, test to get their initial black belt, they had to engage in oral sex with him on him, uh, in fact, and that it was a, it was a particular rite of passage, uh, and that uh, he was uh, arrested and charged with uh, having sexual relations with a person under the age of 18, 
okay? Statutory rape, actually. And he came up citing Eisenstadt versus Bayer. Say, wait a second, wait a second here. Why is it, why is it that, uh, that uh, uh, men and women can have sexual relations with each other when they're not married? Uh, and why is it that it was extended to allow birth control information to be given to people under 16 in the other, the Kerry case? And why is it then that in fact a 16-year-old boy is not allowed to have sexual relations with me? Okay? So if, if you want to look for what you think the limits might be uh, on principles like this that we all smile and cheer about, uh, here's where they're knocking on the door here for you. So you might want to write your paper on this. Uh, or that's only if you want a black belt, perhaps, in Taekwondo. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, just, 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 so you, just so you have some idea that, that these, these issues can be pushed to a certain limit. And that's where the interesting discussions all take place. Is that more of an issue of like consent versus coercion? Yes, but but, but the, the fact is that the state, the states, virtually every state in the country, expressly prohibit a 16-year-old person from consenting to having sexual relations with anybody. Period. And so the, that's where the issue gets put to you. Not in a, in a, this is a bad fact setting, but what what if, what if in fact to 16-year-olds, one of the 16-year-olds who had a constitutional right to be given birth control information, for example, in the Kerry case, what if two 16, what if two 16 year olds got caught, you know, out behind the barn by, you know, local Sheriff Dudley, you know, uh, uh, making the two-back beast, as they as experienced to say. Uh, what, what, where, what, what would happen? What would happen then? You know, uh, they would get the ACLU to come out and they say, what's the story here? How about Eisenstadt versus Baird? That isn't, isn't there a constitutional right of unmarried people to have sexual relations by consent? And in fact, they could both show that they were responsible using birth control, which they got by right of the Kerry case. So where, what happens then? I mean, what, why is it that a 16-year-old, say for example, you have a 16-year-old that has a, a 4.0 grade average, uh, you know, they've been advanced to class, they're both juniors, you know, uh, they're both, uh, one's going to, uh, to Wellesley and the other one's going to Harvard next year on full scholarships with advanced placement. They're smarter than the, than the sheriff, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought would be pretty obvious at the beginning of this whole story. <laughs> but, but the fact, the fact you know, why is it that they don't have the right to make a decision like that? Why is it that the state is viewed uniformly across the country? <coughs> to be imbued with the power, the state power, to say that a 16-year-old person, no matter how intelligent they are, no matter how well protected they are by birth control given to them by dint of constitutional right, how, how is it that they have the authority to say you don't have the legal authority to give consent to engage in sexual relations? Now that's an interesting question, okay? So, uh, so, so that's the question, that, a variation on the question that you asked. You know, and so so wh why is that? And and then you start getting into these fundamental questions about you know what what how is it that the state gets away with it sometimes? Just because everybody happens to agree with it at a given point in time, you know. And then you start to get the questions of what is the relationship between a consensus on the part of the majority within a given polity and the constitutional authority of the state itself. And that's going to lead us into Roe versus Wade, because that's that's part of the issues that uh, that are going to be dealt with uh, on Thursday when you when you read that. What I would suggest is that you you take you take a read of the case of Roe versus Wade to actually to actually get a look at that, because because what you're going to see there is that you well you've got uh, Blackman, Berger, Douglas, Brennan, Stewart, Marshall, and Powell. You've got seven justices. Uh, agreeing with the decision in, in Roe versus Wade, you've got three of those seven writing concurring opinions. Which means, again, you've only got four justices out of the nine actually saying that the grounds for their decision were the majority opinion written by Blackman. And so that if you're in, in the, and I've, I've taught, I've taught uh, both of these cases at the law school level, 
And I, I don't want us to kind of wade into a, a law school level type of discussion right off the bat about these cases. But I want you to, if you can, get a chance to read Roe versus Wade. All you have to do is just Google it. You know, punch Roe versus Wade and find where they cite it. You know, it's, it's going to be cited as 410 U.S. 113. And just uh, get a look at that. Uh, because because the, the fur will fly on Thursday, you know, about Roe versus Wade. Because it's one thing for all of us to, uh, all but maybe one or two of you, uh, to agree with Eisenstadt versus Baird. But when you get to Roe versus Wade, you're going to find some very profound questions that you're going to be confronted by. And you're going to want to be ready to discuss those in class. Because I don't want to have to spend a whole lot of time, again, just talking about the case, but I want us to have much more of a discussion about that because it's an extremely important issue that, that young men and women you know, of, of this particular day and age ought to be uh, thinking about. And because, because the, you know, there, there's an effort uh, every single year to get up in front of the Supreme Court and get them to reverse this. You know, and that if they reverse this, you know, the, you, we're all going to be back in that kind of really weird period that we were in uh, prior to Roe versus Wade, uh, where, you know, not now that we have the right of birth control, I, I thought that winning the Eisenstadt uh, versus Baird case, you know, made it a much more limited problem with, with the issue of abortion. Uh, but, but it's still an adequately significant problem uh, if, it's, if it's deemed to be illegal. Okay, so, that, so those are, so what, what other questions have we got? How does the, on the right, how do they um, support the fact that they're looking for limited government when it seems that many of these positions increase the reach of government? Because they're very stupid. There's a complete, total contradiction between two principles that they hold at the self-same time which I might add doesn't distinguish them from the left, uh, holding completely contradictory ideas uh, at the same time. Uh, that, but the, from, the, from their point of view, as I say, that the, the, the extreme right wing, uh, not the fullest right wing, as I said, remember, the reactionaries are only the second most right wing worldview. There's another one to their right, which is the authoritarian. A straight up authoritarian worldview, which is even more right wing than a simple reactionary worldview. But assuming that this question is about the reactionaries themselves, understand the reactionary worldview is a worldview in which the adherents to that worldview derive their entire sense of identity from confronting some ultimate other. That, that they aren't, they aren't is. is unbridled as straight authoritarians who just believe that the world is complete chaos and therefore you have to have an extraordinarily powerful a monarch, basically, of some major powerful clear thinking uh, monarch to lend, to superimpose order on an otherwise chaotic world. That's the extreme authoritarian view. The reactionaries just view that there's a major struggle going on between two fundamentally dialectically opposed forces. And so that they derive their, their sense of being out of confronting this ultimate other. And in this particular case, they happen to, the reactionaries happen to believe in sort of the European theory of the divine right of authority in the state. Because they, for the most part, run the state. You're dealing with mainly white, male, fairly wealthy property owners and stuff like predominate in the Republican Party. And, uh, and the, that, that particular group think that since they run the state, that the state ought to be endowed with as much power as possible. And that they have that inherent belief in that. The, what, they've, what they've come to do in, in recent years is when they saw that the baby boom generation came on the scene, and there were 82 million of us born between 1943 and 1964, that we basically began to assert ourselves in the democratic process and began to establish some very progressive, uh, liberal and progressive policies uh, in the United States through our access to the federal government. And so what these people did is they started seeing that their ox was being gored. And so what they did is they began to back up into a bunch of these what they call social issues. Now this, this all happened in a very specific way 
at a very specific time uh, back in the, the middle 1960s when the, when the leadership of the Republican Party, the Conservative Caucus, reached out and extended themselves to the extreme right-wing fundamentalists in the Christian community. And there were a whole bunch of alliances that were established at that time, very specifically. And we can discuss that when, when we get around to this discussion of the fundamental philosophical differences between the reactionaries and the progressives. But the bottom line is, is that when they established this alliance, when the reactionaries established this alliance with the fundamentalist Christians, the fundamentalist Christians have this opinion about social values in social matters. And they're the ones that freak out about young people having sexual intercourse. They freak out about people dancing, touching each other, you know, breathing in the same room. You know, they, they, have a whole, they have a whole series of things that they get very upset about. And so when the Republican hierarchy established an alliance with them, what they did is they reached out and they, they brought into their agenda some of the social issues. So despite the fact that they had this, this uh, attitude about, about government, this normal, almost authoritarian theory of the divine right of kings, what they did is they, they, didn't, they, they got into a contradictory position. And so what they started to do is they started to, just out of their own self-interest, began to oppose the federal government, which had been taken over by liberals in the, in the baby boom generation. And so despite their basic instincts about government, they began to fight back against the central government. And they used to start, they started making the arguments about how the states ought to be able to have more and more authority because the vestiges of the Republican Party were able to establish easier control over the states. And, the, and so that they had, they had certain states, for example, where the overwhelming majority of people in those states were not members of the baby boom generation. And so that they could, in fact, get more control over them. And so that that's what started to happen. You started to get these contradictions between their basic theories of government, of authoritarian type of government. And they began to back up and take contradictory positions against centralized government. But, but you'll see very much on behalf of superpowers on the part of the state to, uh, to impose constraints on individual conduct, especially in the moral area. So that's, what, that's, how that, that's how that actually began to happen. So, so, so these, are, these are some of the, let's see if are there any more, any more questions from the, from the students here? Because we're, we're knocking on the, the door here, even though our, our clock has stopped at five minutes to five forever here. I don't, I don't want to see you, but uh, I can just go on and on because i got lots of time left. Uh, but anyway, so so that's, that's leading us into the discussion of Roe versus Wade on Thursday. And uh, as I said, I'm going to, I'm going to try to, confine my remarks about it uh, to a fairly short presentation because I'll assume that you'll have read it by then uh, and that you'll have some fairly strong ideas about it and uh, we'll, we'll start talking about it fairly quickly uh, when you get it. So, so come prepared to ask some questions. Justin? I just had a question. Yes. Yeah. Just a small question. That's all right. Uh, there's a line in this article in The Nation. Take, for example, that young man who was studying law at Harvard at the time of Eisenstadt just down the road. Boston University, does that sound familiar to you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But anyway, this is, this is a... I don't think that was... No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 that, that, that was, that's a there, reference to Romney. Romney. Yeah, yeah that's Romney. 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 No, Romney. Romney was a guy who was very, very supportive of, of, of rights of, of people and birth control and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, in fact, by the time he got to be governor, he was the guy that was governor that authorized the arrest of Bill Baird in Massachusetts. So it was under his administration that Bill Baird was prosecuted. Wasn't he a sheriff that caught those kids behind the barn? No, that was, that was, that was Eisenstadt. Oh, okay. That was Eisenstadt. Okay, so, okay, so there, there's, there's this week. Uh, come ready to jump up and down and talk about Roe versus Wade. And we'll, we'll continue on. If anybody has any questions about logistics, how the course is running, just come up here and ask afterwards.